I know a lot of you here in the room, uh, but there are a number of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. For those, my name is Chris Williams, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Chamber of Commerce here in the greater Nashua area. I've been in that role now for coming up, up to nine years, um, working in that capacity, helping to advocate for business interests here within the greater Nashua region. Some of you might be wondering why a chamber president would be up here on stage talking about the issue of homelessness and helping to facilitate a program focused on eradicating homelessness. Well, for me, it's very simple. Homelessness is not purely a social issue. It's not just something that impacts us on a personal level. It's also something that impacts our community on an economic and business level. And you'll get to hear some more about that particular perspective and that angle on ending homelessness tonight uh, through the remarks of our guest speaker here later this evening. So I'm very thrilled to be here tonight at the invitation of Mary Tamposi and Peter Kelleher to play the role of MC this evening. It's personally gratifying and it's also professionally gratifying to be able to play this sort of a role on behalf of our business community here in the Nashua area. If you were here last year, right about this time, you were part of our kickoff to the first year of the Ending Homelessness Fund. And tonight is not just a call to action, but it's also a celebration, rewinding us back to that year and congratulating ourselves as a collective community for actually making that first year a huge success. If you were here last year, you would have heard Bob Keating, David Gilmore, and Peter Kelleher get up in front of the room that night and ask all of us as a community to aim for the goal of raising $100,000 in the first year of this Ending Homelessness Initiative. I'm thrilled here tonight to share with you, if you don't already know, we were successful in that effort and raised over $100,000 in its first year. I think it's a whole lot more than that, actually, if you count the pledges and others that have come in. I was at an event just a few weeks ago, right before Christmas, at Not Your Average Joe's, where they handed a $10,000 check to Harbor Homes specifically for that initiative. And I think we're enjoying some of the Not Your Average Joe's food in the back of the room here tonight as well. Tonight, we're not only celebrating our success of the past year, not only the success of the first year in this Ending Homelessness Initiative, but we're also here tonight marking the kickoff of the 2015 campaign for ending homelessness. If we're to truly end chronic homelessness here in Nashua, we can't simply rest on the success of 2014, but must remain diligent in 2015 to continue that success. To help us with that here tonight, you're gonna hear from some people that all of us know quite well, and you'll also get to hear from a couple of others that we're excited to share with you here tonight and introduce you to. To help me with this, I would like to introduce to you a leader in our local nonprofit and philanthropic community, someone that many of us know well, someone who's been at the helm of Harbor Homes and the Partnership for Successful Living for close to 33 years. He is responsible for helping Harbor Homes grow from a small agency to the largest supplier of New Hampshire emergency shelter, transitional, permanent, supportive, and income-based affordable housing for our homeless men, women, and children, including our veterans here in the state of New Hampshire. It gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to the stage this evening, President and CEO of Harbor Homes, Peter Keller. Thank you, Chris, for uh, all of the wonderful things that you do for the Nashua community um, and uh, all that you do for nonprofits in, in our area as well. The fact that you are here, I think, is a testament to your understanding of the bigger picture in our community, and we thank you for that. <coughs> Welcome, everyone. We thank you for joining us on this bitter, cold January evening, reminiscent of last year at this time to join in with this landmark celebration. A night like this makes us all appreciate having a home to go to. This is so much more important for homeless individuals and families 
But before we begin, I'd like to, I wish to acknowledge and extend thanks for their attendance tonight to our, our esteemed Mayor Donnelly Lozo, Governor Maggie Hassan, Senator State, State Senator Betty Lasky, members of our Board of Aldermen, our esteemed Board of Directors, Not Your Average Joe's Restaurant, distinguished members of the press and community business partners, and cherished friends. As many of you may know, the Ending Homelessness Fund was created in 2014 by a group of concerned citizens who wanted to find a way to end homelessness in the greater Nashua community. A big task. The two co-founders of the fund are Hillary and Robert Keating, and the honorary chairman of the fund is Dr. David Gilmore. I'd like to ask them and all members of the Ending Homelessness Fund Committee to please stand and be recognized. Thank you, and I cannot begin to tell you how hard they have worked over this year. <clears throat> if, if anyone here might dare to consider becoming part of that committee, we, we need your help. <laughs> so that is a plea to come join us and uh, find out about the excitement that's happening in that group. The Ending Homelessness Fund, whose mission is to house chronically homeless men, women, and children, including our veterans, who are identified each year. Harbor Homes believes in and practices the nationally known Housing First model, which is built on the premise that before a person is able to make good progress toward living a productive and independent life, a safe, secure home is critical first. However, we don't just hand over the keys. We also provide a variety of supportive services that will help our clients remain in their new homes. For a, chron a chronically homeless person or family, the journey of remaining housed is often fraught with challenges. Many local providers are res reticent to help chronically homeless individuals, but we at Harbor Homes welcome them. We see housing as a form of health care. We see homelessness in terms of diagnosis, a prescription, and a prognosis. The prescription is permanent supportive housing. The prognosis is excellent. In fact, the average length of stay in our permanent housing programs continues to be about six years. The Partnership for Successful Living is not only a pathway to survival, but also an organization that imparts a sense of hope. Our clients feel a true sense of belonging within our housing and supportive pro programs. We see family bonds grow stronger, an improvement in health outcomes, clients have better self-esteem, increased self-respect. There is an improvement in mental health and substance use disorder recovery. Permanent housing also results in a decrease in crime and incarceration. Our clients know that the entire community <coughs> is supporting them and boosting them up so that they can be at their personal best. It takes a village, and all of us, and all of you, are that village. Not only is this the right thing to do, but studies have proven that permanent supportive housing ends up costing far less than other solutions, and therefore results in a huge monetary savings for cities and taxpayers alike. If you look around this room, you'll see a lot of statistics and I think you will uh, find there's excellent data here that really points to the cost-effective value of permanent supportive housing. Each year, when the Federal Housing and Urban Development Agency awards us a grant that allows us to continue this work, we're required to raise a prescribed dollar amount of funds <coughs> in order to fully release the contingent monies of that grant. These funds allow Harbor Homes to provide permanent housing, supportive services, such as primary and behavioral health care, employment assistance, substance use disorder treatment, and a large variety of additional services for our chronically homeless individuals and families in need. This year, we're happy to share that we have provided homes to 108 
chronically homeless individuals and families. <laughs> 36 of whom were homeless veterans. And of all the charts that are hanging around, this is my favorite. Please uh, take some time and look at that. I also want to thank the staff that manage and operate our housing programs who have helped us in this achievement. To house 108 people in any venture is a <coughs> monumental task in a year. And I'd like to ask that all of the staff that have been involved in the process of housing uh, those 108 people to please stand and be recognized. They are the true heroes here that have been carrying the, the, the amount of work that make all of this possible. We reached important milestones in this last year. We met and surpassed our monetary goal thanks to our generous community and we were able to house all chronically homeless persons that we were able to identify in 2014. I've been here for almost 33 years. And that's something that <coughs> has never happened before. We are thrilled to be able to share this news with you. But we could not have achieved this success alone. I sincerely want to thank the Greater Nashua Continuum of Care, as well as numerous human service agencies that have been partners side by side with us in this effort. Nashua Soup Kitchen, Marguerite's Place, Front Door Agency, Anne Marie House, Southern New Hampshire Rescue Mission, Greater Nashua Mental Health Center, all have been key players. I also want to recognize and acknowledge the extraordinary leadership of Maureen Ryan, who is the Director of the Office of Homeless and Housing Services with the State of New Hampshire. Without that leadership, we would not be able to do all the things that we do. There she is. And we wouldn't be able to afford to house and maintain our homeless neighbors with all of the necessary vital supportive services, without the overwhelming support from our government, business, media, private members of the community who continuously united with us to achieve this momentous landmark accomplishment. Simply put, I most humbly submit we just wouldn't be here in this position without your incredible help, dedication, and support. I speak for all of us at Harbor Homes and the Partnership for Successful Living. We are sincerely and profoundly grateful. Harbor Homes remains relentless in its efforts to combat the plight of homelessness. Although sadly, the plight of homelessness has not yet been eradicated, Newly identified homeless will no doubt emerge in 2015, and the continued cost of supportive services that are vital to maintaining sustainability for those already housed will remain a reality. This will take money, a lot of it. That we must once again raise in 2015, so that we may repeat the accomplishment in 2014 we urgently need your help to see our way to meeting our 2015 goal of $200,000 to allow us to provide protected and secure homes and services to our chronically homeless individuals and families once again. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and all that you have done. And now I'm very honored to introduce one of our state's great leaders who is solidly there for all New Hampshire citizens. Governor Maggie Hassan. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, Peter, thank you for the introduction. More importantly, thank you for the work 
you have done and Harper Homes has done uh, for our community and our state. Uh, to Robert and Hillary Keating, who are founders of the Ending Homelessness Fund, um, I was thinking about the title tonight. That's a pretty gutsy thing to do, to say you're going to end homelessness. And I thank you for being gutsy and insisting, because you are making great progress. And so thank you. <laughs> to Philip Mangano, our keynote speaker, thank you for being here and for all your work and leadership uh, in so many different roles uh, on this issue. Uh, to Senator Lasky, who I haven't said hi to yet. I got to see Elliot, but I haven't seen Betty yet. I saw her earlier I'm today. Representing her. You're representing her? Okay. Um, and I know Mayor Lozo was here, and I think she, she had to uh, go to a, another engagement. Uh, but certainly the leadership at the city level and um, within the community has been critical to all the other elected officials who are here tonight. Thank you as well for your work. Chris, thank you and the Nashua Chamber for taking a big view of what economic development and vitality and growth is. Um, it's really great to have you representing the chamber here. Uh, that goes too for the private businesses who are here and who have contributed to this fund um, and to this work in so many different ways and for everything that our private businesses do in New Hampshire to give back to our communities. And um, there are a whole lot of advocates here tonight who've done so much work, not only to help end homelessness through this project, but to bring attention to the issue in the first place. Um, you know, I said a minute or two ago, I was thinking about the name of the fund, Ending Homelessness. And I think a lot of people a decade ago would have thought that homelessness wasn't something you could ever end. It was just kind of something that happens in every society. Um, it doesn't have to, and it certainly shouldn't in a democracy. Because in a democracy, what we believe is that all citizens deserve the opportunity to live healthy and productive lives. Housing in particular is critical to how we can function in our personal lives and in our economic lives. It's also truly a measure of dignity. Um, I happen to have been raised by a father who recognized this and was one of the people who wrote the legislation that established the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And when I once asked him, I don't get why you're so involved in housing, Dad, he said, just think about the importance of it. It's every human being center. And you can't really function and you can't participate if you don't have a safe and appropriate place to live. It's also just critical to ensuring that our most vulnerable populations can live independently and really have the opportunity to contribute to our economic and civic life. It spurs economic development, as Chris noted, and it supports a growing and strong middle class. So to truly prevent homelessness, we have to continue to work together from the individual and community level on up. It's something we have to do to build a stronger and more innovative state, and we're going to get at homelessness by building a stronger and more innovative state. That's a state where all citizens are included in our shared success and prosperity. And that's why at the state level, we're focused on a number of things, holding down the cost of higher education so that all of our people can have access to the kind of skills and training that will allow them to participate fully and lead in the 21st century economy. It means that we need to maintain our commitment to healthcare expansion in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, we have 32,000 people who have signed up since mid-August for our healthcare expansion. Uh, they are from a whole range of backgrounds and uh, personal situations, uh, but they are getting preventive and primary care, and we are seeing a decline, for instance, of the uninsured at our community uh, health centers. So it's, it's good progress. We need to do as much as we can to support our job-creating businesses so that people will have access to the kind of good-paying jobs that give them independence and the opportunity to participate in their communities and raise their families. And uh, we know that one of the things we need to do in New Hampshire is restore and increase New Hampshire's minimum wage so that people who work have a chance for the dignity 
uh, that comes with a livable wage. Uh, I'm particularly pleased tonight to be here with all of you celebrating the great progress that the Ending Homelessness Fund has made in its first year. It's a critical initiative to house the chronically homeless, uh, the first of its kind in New Hampshire to focus on bringing in private funds to end homelessness. And one of the things we always do in New Hampshire is look for ways where state government and the private sector can partner in effective ways, both bring something important to the table, and this is a great example of that. You've had an incredibly successful first year in 2014, surpassing your goals, and uh, as important as the financial metrics are, um, the ones that are up on the wall all around here showing what a difference you have all made in the lives of many of our homeless, including veterans, are the most important metrics around. Uh, this one in particular I was looking at, again, people would say there's nothing we can do about this problem, and you've got the metrics, you've got the evidence to show that there is, in fact, something you can do. Um, I'm particularly grateful for that chart, too, because we all know that veterans who sacrifice so bravely to protect the rest of us and to ensure our freedoms and our way of life um, deserve all of our support. We can never repay them fully, uh, but we can certainly insist that they have the dignity that comes with housing and with supports when they need it. And I am particularly inspired uh, tonight by the story of two veterans who you're going to hear from a little bit later. I think I'm going to have to leave before they speak, but I had the chance to talk with them a little bit uh, before uh, the program started. And they have both overcome homelessness and are with us tonight. So John Elston and Laura LaRue, um, I don't know where you sat down. There you are. Thank you so much for being with us, not only uh, for the work you've done to overcome your own situations, but then to pay it forward and help other people. We're delighted to have you here, and thank you. Um, So again, I just want to thank you all for being great examples of what I call the New Hampshire all hands on deck spirit. Uh, it's not only an all hands on deck spirit, it's a real uh, pragmatic spirit. You've identified an issue and you've come together and figured out how to begin to really make a difference on that issue. And you're demonstrating to people not only here in New Hampshire but around the country that it's something that can be done. You're also demonstrating that when we care for each other, we truly do get stronger. And that starts with recognizing each and every member of a democracy as the individual that he or she is, understanding that each person in a democracy matters and needs to have their voice at the table, understanding that every time in our democracy that we've brought people in from the margins, we've grown stronger. We have a great history of inclusion in New Hampshire. That history inc includes the understanding that inclusion is hard. This is not easy work that any of you do. The work of democracy is really hard. But our founders were confident enough in each of us, in each successive generation of Americans, to believe that we would keep at it and that we would improve generation to generation. We would recognize more and more individuals for who they are and what their potential is, and that that would allow all of us not only to strengthen as a democracy, but to grow as an economy and to thrive together. That's what you are all about. That's what the Ending Homelessness Fund is doing, and I am so grateful and I am so proud to recognize all of you tonight. Thank you so much. Governor, thank you very much for the time that you were able to spend with us here uh, this evening. I think we're blessed in New Hampshire to have a governor who keeps her eye on the strategic horizon for our state, uh, but who also keeps her finger on the local pulse of programs and agencies like Harbor Homes that are the lifeblood of the community fabric. So thank you to the governor for the time that she was able to take with us here this evening. 
We're also fortunate to have a lot of support from our congressional delegation. A lot of the programs and initiatives that Harbor Homes puts on through its own agency and through its various partnerships are reliant upon federal support from our senators and congresspeople that represent us down in Washington. So I'm thrilled to have representatives from three different congressional offices here with us here tonight. The senators themselves and our Congresswoman Custer are a little busy uh, with other things on their plate here this evening, but they've sent the very best from their offices to represent them here tonight. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce to you here tonight Mr. Peter Clark, who represents Senator Shaheen's office. Peter, thank you. Good evening. Senator Shaheen is in Washington tonight, but I will read a letter on her behalf. Dear friends, thank you so much for extending an invitation to your ending Homelessness Fund annual kickoff event. I wish I were able to attend this evening. I applaud Harbor Homes' vital work, which strengthens many members of our community. By providing low-income, homeless, and disabled citizens with not only housing, but also health care, employment, job training, and major support services, Harbor Homes, Inc. has improved the quality of life for thousands of New Hampshire residents since its founding in 1980. Your efforts to advocate for New Hampshire's most vulnerable residents have encouraged many more members of our community to become involved in the fight to eradicate homelessness. I am proud to support the important work that your organization does to help achieve lives of economic independence and self-sufficiency. Tonight's kickoff is a chance to recognize the supporters of the Ending Homelessness Fund and celebrate the progress you have all made in providing housing opportunities for the chronically homeless. However, tonight's event is also a reminder that there is still work to be done to break the cycle of homelessness and make sure that every New Hampshire citizen is safely housed. The success of this fund is a great example of a community-wide resolve we need to overcome this challenging issue. Thank you again for the invitation, and I wish Harbor Homes the best in 2015. Sincerely, Jean Shaheen, United States Senator. Peter, thank you very much for spending your evening here with us here tonight on Senator Shaheen's behalf. I'm also very privileged to introduce on behalf of Senator Kelly Ayotte, our hometown U.S. Senator here in Nashua, Mr. Chris Connolly. Chris? Uh, good evening. It's my honor to be here and bring greetings from Senator Ayotte. Dear honored guests, to the members of the Ending Homelessness Fund, Board of Directors, volunteers, and staff of Harbor Homes, I wish to join in congratulating you as you celebrate the one-year anniversary of the establishment of the Ending Homelessness Fund. The fund was established with the goal of raising $100,000 in 2014 to be used to place chronically homeless individuals in Nashua in permanent housing and to provide vital supportive services to sustain their independence. Through the generosity of corporate and business donors and the community at large, the fund surpassed its 2014 fundraising goal. I hope that tonight's celebration of this milestone is every bit as successful as the care, compassion, and leadership that you bring to this worthwhile endeavor. I appreciate all that you are doing to eliminate homelessness amongst our most challenged homeless individuals and families. Thank you for the significant contributions that you are making to the Nashua area and to the state of New Hampshire. Best wishes, Kelly Ayotte, United States Senator. I'd like to introduce to you tonight a, a young woman many of us probably know well. She grew up here in many of our backyards, and that's Michaela Foster, who is here tonight representing Congresswoman Ann McLean Custer. Michaela. <laughs> Good evening, Congressman Custer sends her regrets that she's not able to be here this evening and has asked me to read this letter on her behalf. Dear friends, thank you to Harbor Homes for the invitation to participate in the Ending Homelessness Fund annual kickoff. Please accept my apologies that I could not be with you for this important event, but know my thoughts are with you as you continue working to raise awareness about chronic homelessness in New Hampshire and as you celebrate another successful year of the Ending Homelessness Fund. Chronic homelessness is a serious issue in the Granite State, and I commend the work of Harbor Homes to bring this issue to the forefront. 
As a nation and a state, it is essential that we continue to acknowledge this issue and support organizations like Harbor Homes that provide services to help the less fortunate in our community. I am inspired by tonight's event and by the services Harbor Homes provides to those in the greater Nashua area, thanks in no small part to the success of the Ending Homelessness Fund. But our work is not yet done. We are here tonight to recognize the challenges ahead and to continue our efforts to support the Ending Homelessness Fund so that Harbor Homes may continue its great work. I am honored to have this opportunity to acknowledge the, tr the tremendous contributions of Harbor Homes to ending homelessness in the greater Nashua area. I look forward to the future successes of both the Ending Homelessness Fund and Harbor Homes, and I stand ready to assist in any way that I can. On behalf of my constituents across New Hampshire's 2nd Congressional District, I want to thank everyone from Harbor Homes and from sur the surrounding community who have been a part of these efforts to help the Granite State's less fortunate. Sincerely, Ann McLean Custer, Member of Congress. It is now my honor to introduce two people that embody the spirit of what the entire Partnership for Successful Living is all about. Two people that it's all, these are the people that we're here for tonight. John Elston and Laura LaRue. It's an honor to be here. Believe me, it is an honor to be here when you listen to these people talking up here and you see what the community has done and what Harbor Homes and done. Peter Kelleher, I've known you for nine years. I've actually had two bouts. In 2006, I was taken in by Harbor Homes in the old 440 building on Amherst Street, if you remember that. And I've watched and I've actually worked here helping uh, with Buckingham and Dalianus right across the street. Both times, I mean, you don't know where you're going to go. You, don't, you, know, you never think you're going to have this happen to you. I didn't even know what benefits I had as a veteran because I never used them. But when you need them, you have them. And then you have some place like Harbor Homes. I mean, look at that sign. That's phenomenal. You have a place like Harbor Homes that has counselors, uh, that has people that employ you, teach you how to get back in and be a productive member of society, show you what programs are available to help you. And then when, not only when you're done or when you're gone and you're back working in society, they're there for you. They talk to you. Uh, I, I love coming and talking to Peter. I'm usually the one for the veterans program, but I'm going to tell you that there are other homeless people out there, and I'm going to share this real quick story. I'm talking to a veteran, telling him he doesn't have to sleep out in the cold. There is a place for him to go. And I'm focusing on this guy. He's a veteran. And right behind him is another guy. Listen to me. This other guy taps me on the shoulder as I'm walking away. He goes, man, I wish I had served because I have no place to go tonight. And now you have ending the homeless fund that he can look forward to. Um, I can't say anything about myself. You guys all do the work in here. I do want to say that when I very seldom, when I do go out and speak, do I get to have a female come up because they are part of this program too. And the veterans and the homeless, very much a part of it. I had to hire this one now that I'm working to get her to come speak, but I'd like to introduce you to Laura LaRue. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and listening to me now. Um, I am a veteran of the United States Air Force. Um, I have always been empowered, a very, very strong person. I have a good education, had a great job. Um, I'm a single mom for 17 years of two sons. My youngest son has kidney disease, so, you know, it's always been a challenge. Um, and then the company I worked for for a really long time sold to a big conglomerate. And next thing I know, I don't have a job. I didn't see it coming. I had no idea that that's how that stuff worked. I didn't know. And um, so, okay, all right, I'm good. I can do this. I wasn't even going to file for unemployment because I have such a good education. I'll get a job. Whipping out the resumes, nobody called. My son's medical insurance deemed that I had to file for unemployment. So, okay, all right, I get that. Um, 
Then I started getting close to losing that. Um, then my landlord's not happy with me. And I'm a very proud person. I'm very proud. I don't discuss my problems with anybody, ever. Well, <laughs> get over that, apparently. But, um, <laughs> um, so I just kept working and working. And I, how could I not get a job? I don't understand. What's, I, have, I was a member of the planning board for six years in my town. I have two college degrees. Went back to college again. Became a certified paralegal. Tried to build up that resume. It just wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. And I felt like such a horrible failure. I have a sick son that I have to take care of. So you do stuff that you will never do any other time in your life. I, was, I received my medical care at the VA Medical Center in Manchester, which I am so blessed. What a wonderful place. I've never been so well cared for in my life. And I saw 211. And I called. And um, I got Harbor Homes. And they couldn't do enough. They were like, like pushing me along. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. I didn't have time to feel sorry for myself anymore. And I, I no longer felt like a failure. It's just that bad things happen to good people sometimes. And they helped me. They empowered me and just pushed me and pushed me. And then I was blessed to meet Andrea Reed, who is a saint. She's amazing. I met with her in Nashua. I live in Milford. By the time I got home, I had like 15 emails about jobs and do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. I said, oh my lord. So then um, I got an um, email from her to go meet him. <laughs> <laughs> and I went in and met with him, and we had a good rapport right away. He was funny. Um, and I said, wait a minute, do I have this job? He's like, yes, you have the job. I have no clue what he said from that point on. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm like, i got to get to my kids. <laughs> so I was there maybe another half hour, and I went skipping out the door. And I'm OK. My kids are OK. Even my dog's OK. <laughs> and it's because of Harbor Homes. They've got to keep going. They've got to keep going. They, we need them. I needed them, and they were there. Thank you all. Wow. <laughs> you see these charts around the room with data and graphics, and, and they tell a story. They tell a really good story. But they don't even come close to comparing to getting to hear directly from John and Laura and putting a face with what the mission of this program is all about and what it can do for our community. That just listening to that is more powerful than all these charts and data combined. So Laura and John, thank you for coming in and sharing that with us tonight. I mentioned earlier that you would get to hear from a number of folks that all of us know well because we're all here in this community. I'm excited to introduce to you tonight someone who is not from here but who has come in especially for this evening. A man who is widely known across the country as a champion of efforts to end homelessness here in America, Mr. Philip Mangano. If you don't already know who Philip is or his background, let me share with you a little bit. Some of it you might know and some of it you might not. Philip currently serves as the president of the American Roundtable to Abolish Homelessness, an organization that he founded in Boston in 2009. But Philip has long been engaged in efforts regarding homelessness long before he founded the American Roundtable. For seven years prior to that founding, he chaired the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, a position to which he had been appointed in 2002 by President George W. Bush. But for Philip, it began even longer ago than that. For him, it started back in the 1970s as a spiritual passion when he was working in Los Angeles at the time as a music and talent agent. Philip went to see a film back then by one of his favorite directors, 
The movie was called Brother Sun, Sister Moon, a film depicting the life of St. Francis, a 13th century Italian merchant who gave up his luxurious lifestyle and dedicated his life to helping the poor around him. Philip was touched by the film and went on to read the biography of St. Francis. And that was when he decided to model his life after St. Francis by doing what he could do to address homeless issues here in the United States. Philip left his career in the world of public relations and instead put his natural charisma and considerable PR skills to work on behalf of ending homelessness here in the US. His first experience with tackling homelessness involved working a bread line back in Boston and then eventually serving as the Director of Homeless Services for the City of Cambridge before moving on to serve as the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Housing and Shelter Alliance. Today, rather than wearing the robes of St. Francis, Philip dons a business suit and spends his time in the offices of governors, public officials, and high-profile business leaders across our country, convincing them of the business and economic case for abolishing chronic homelessness. As Philip will tell us this evening, efforts to fight homelessness have for too long been focused on treating the symptoms of homelessness rather than upon the actual roots of the problem and abolishing it altogether. His message is wholly contained within our own local homelessness fund, championed tonight by Peter, Bob, David Gilmore, and our friends here at Harbor Homes. It's with great personal pressure and respect that I introduce to you tonight Mr. Philip Mangano and invite him to the podium. Wow. I can now see why Chris is referred to sometimes as the Toastmaster General of New Hampshire. He certainly does his research, doesn't he? He's a dangerous man, but I thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Chris. And I was so glad to hear from your governor, weren't you? Do you think every governor in the country is out talking about homelessness? I can tell you from personal experience, not that often. So to hear this level of sophistication and commitment and passion that she makes on the issue, that's very encouraging, isn't it? It gets our morale up, doesn't it? I mean, if you have the highest person, you know, the chief executive officer of your state thinking and talking about this issue, it's encouraging to all of us to get the job done. She's right, it does sound daunting to end homelessness, doesn't it? The word end, abolish. These are tough verbs on this issue. We've been kind of going over and over it a, a long time. Committees, commissions, task forces, all manner of activity. But we think, what's changed? What's happened? That's why it's so important to hear from people like John and Laura, isn't it? Because they are the living embodiment of what this night what Harbor Homes does, what this fund does. It's all about just one thing, getting the job done, getting the mission accomplished. And while we love the miracles, don't we, in these two stories, great, compelling stories, we love that miracle, don't we, the miracles? We do. But the work of Harbor Homes, the work of this fund, is to make these miracles commonplace, to make them an everyday occurrence so that we're not surprised by someone getting up and saying that their life, there's been an intervention and they've left the street, left the shelter, left the high anxiety that Laura described to go into a stability and the security of a place to live. That's the work of Harbor Homes. That's the work of this fund to end homelessness. So I'm glad that we use the hard <coughs> verbs, end, abolish. It gives us something to reach for, doesn't it? To aspire to. We don't want to be just talking about managing homelessness. We did that for 25 years. It didn't work out that well. The numbers only went up. It's only when we talk about getting the job done that we see this chart, this off-referred-to chart that tells us that our work together as a community 
when we invest in an agency that's getting the job done, when we put the resources of government together with the private sector, and we partner them and marry them together, we can get the job done. We can get it done for veterans. We can get it done for those people on the street that we pass by. We think a blanket and a bowl of soup is the best that we can do. And yet, we know that there are interventions that will literally end the homelessness of those folk. It's a good thing, isn't it? We do want to be optimistic about this issue, don't we? Can I get an amen here? <laughs> It's not, it's not unconstitutional yet in New Hampshire to say amen at a public meeting, is it? I hope not. I know we have some lawyers in the back. They'll probably look it up. But I mean, we can have as much optimism. Uh, uh, you're glad to be in Nashua tonight, aren't you? Yeah. Where would you rather be? Phoenix or someplace? <laughs> it's like 87 degrees today in Phoenix. I hear there's a big game coming up there, too. And I think we're all of one accord about that game. Am I right? Yes. I think we are. You know, I was in Phoenix recently, not for the game, unfortunately. But uh, every morning, as I was trying to do exercises in my room, you know, just the old-fashioned kind of exercise, you don't need a gym, you just do them. <laughs> Um, I would put on the television just to get over the boringness of the exercise. And every morning, it would be the same meteorologist. And every morning, she would say, today, in Phoenix, it's going to be 107 degrees. And the next day, today, in Phoenix, it's going to be 107, day after day. Thought that's a pretty easy job, isn't it? I mean, just just video that and show it. But astonishingly, on Friday, she said, "Today in Phoenix, it's going to be 107 degrees, but with the wind chill factor, it'll feel like 105." <laughs> I thought that's what you call optimism, isn't it? That's optimism beyond optimism. Well, that's the kind of optimism we have to have on this issue. And uh, what we're showing in this room, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, of course. But my guess is in this room, there are some people who, when they go to the voting booth, there's a D after their name. That there are some people in this room, there's an R after their name. There are some people in this room, there's an I after their name. The good news for all of us tonight is, on this issue, there is no D or R or I. We're just Americans partnered to get the mission accomplished. Amen? Amen. There's no difference between us. We're just partnered to do that. Now, we've learned a lot about this issue over the years. One of the key things we've learned, and it's so discouraging to learn this, I have to say, it's discouraging. We've learned that good intentions, and how long have you had good intentions on homelessness in Nashua? Decades, right? How about well-meaning programs? Decades. Humanitarian gestures? Decades, maybe centuries. But what we've learned is, if good intentions, well-meaning programs, and humanitarian gestures could get the mission accomplished, homelessness would have been history well over a decade ago. But it's not. They don't, and it's not. So we have to figure out what does work. If all of our best inclinations and intentions don't get the job done, what does get the job done? Well, here's the good news on homelessness. Someone standing at this podium even a decade ago could not have said this. But on the issue of homelessness right now, we have this assurance. We know what to do, and we know how to do it. We know what to do, and we know how to do it. We know what to do because we've talked to homeless people themselves. 
Instead of mistaking the customer of all of our activity, all of our funding, all of our resources, all of our hard work, mistaking the provider agencies or professors or people with opinions, we've gone directly to the homeless person themselves. They're our true customer. They're our true consumer. And when we ask homeless people what they want, if somebody had asked Laura what she wanted, she would have been pretty clear. She wouldn't have needed a prompt list. She wanted a place to live for her and her kids. A place to live. I've literally gone all over the world unprompted, simply asked homeless people what they wanted. Shockingly, <laughs> shockingly, they never asked for a pill a program or a protocol, ever. They ask for one thing, a place, a place to live. We know what to do, and it's informed by the customer, by the consumer. It's not good intentions anymore. It's not what we think would be best for the homeless person. It's what the homeless person themselves want. And thinking about the homeless person as a customer puts us into kind of a business idea of what we need to do and it's about time we got there because for a lot of years we looked through a social service lens at the issue of homelessness that's not a bad thing to do but when you look through a social service lens and you see homeless people what you think is how can we serve them and we did for 25 years we rolled up our sleeves and serviced homeless people but you know what happened the opposite of this right here the numbers just kept going up. It just didn't work. You know that, you know Einstein's quote, it's quoted by a lot of people, but it was actually Einstein who said, the very definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. That's exactly what we were doing on homelessness for well over 25 years. We didn't listen to the customer or the consumer. We were so busy figuring out for homeless people what they wanted instead of just literally asking them what they wanted. Now we know what to do. We need to create housing. We need to access housing. And that's exactly what Harbor Homes has been about for the 33 years that Peter's been with it. I think you were the first employee, weren't you, Peter? You were the only employee at that time, as I recall. Best I remember. <laughs> so you were everything. You were the CEO, the president, the case manager, cleaned the office at the end of the day. We know what to do now. And the really good news about that is we know how to do it. And Harbor Homes is a brilliant model for what to do. It's to create and access housing for our homeless neighbors. And that's all homeless people are, right? They're just our neighbors. And we learned when we were pretty small what our responsibility was to our neighbor, didn't we? We learned it in school. We learned it in Sunday school. We learned it in civics, we learned what our responsibility was to our neighbor. Minimally, it was to treat the other person as you yourself would want to be treated. So if we just remember that there is a single name for every homeless person, just one name, we know the name of every homeless person, it's neighbor. And if we just treated that homeless person as we would want ourselves treated, it would go a long way. That's part of how to do it, how to get the job done. So we know what to do and we know how to do it. So what's the problem here? Well, government doesn't have that entrepreneurial gene. It wasn't in that line when they, these things were given out. So if something's working, normally we would think, if, this is, if you're rearing your kid, and something's working to make that kid a better kid, what do you do? Less of that? Do something else? You do more of that. Well, government somehow, they skip that part of. <laughs> so government will do something, they'll fund something great. And then by the time the study appears that shows that was great, that worked, government is off to something else. They never go all in on something that works. 
So government, as much as we appreciate what they do do, because they don't have the entrepreneurial gene, they're not going to help us get to the level of scale because it's really an issue of scaling. There's only one issue left in scaling. If you know what to do and you know how to do it, it's only scaling what you have to do. It's to get the number up of units of housing commensurate with the size of the problem. That's why last night you were out counting homeless people because you want to know the size of the problem and then you want to create a solution that matches the size of the problem. That's kind of elementary, isn't it? You don't need a PhD from HBS to know this, right? But government and philanthropy, normal channels of philanthropy, they just don't have enough resources to do it. They might do it, but they fund pilots and demonstrations, so they can't do it either. So we know we need to scale. We know government doesn't have the entrepreneurial gene or the risk averse. Philanthropy doesn't have it, so what do we do? How do we get some commensurate to the size of the problem? That's exactly where the fund comes in that we're celebrating tonight, isn't it? It comes from the private sector, the much maligned in many places private sector, the greedy, so-called greedy private sector that in fact, in many communities, is on the front lines of social issues. And you should be so proud that here in Nashua that Robert and Hillary had this vision and have brought people together to follow up on that vision so that in fact you don't have to depend entirely on the government, though you depend on them somewhat, or philanthropy, though you depend on them somewhat. There's another avenue to get to where you're going. So think about it, in their first year, raising the money that they raised, 108 people who had stories similar to John's and Laura's, 108 of your neighbors, 108 people who probably represent 500 years of homelessness, are now inside, not out now put a key into a lock and go into their own private space are not subject to the vagaries of emergency shelters or the streets of your community. That's a good thing, isn't it? Now that appeals to our moral and spiritual sides, right? The well-being of the people who are housed. But let's look at it a different way. Let me transport you, if I might, to San Diego. I know you'd resist that because you'd miss, you would, or you'd wonder where you were if you didn't see white <laughs> encompassing your environment. But you know what they brag about? You know what the Chamber of Commerce brags about in San Diego? 330 days a year of sunshine. And you know what? They deliver on it. It's amazing. <laughs> now in San Diego, this is a while ago, they had accommodated for many years a rising number of homeless people because homeless people are as smart as you are. It's a beautiful place, San Diego. Why would you want to be in Skid Row in Los Angeles or up in Seattle where it rains just about every single day? And that is, you're right, it's a shot at Seattle. <laughs> you're right. You're right. I was trying to mask that a little bit. Not too well. Why be there when you could be in San Diego? So homeless people go to San Diego, and you know what? They have beautiful beaches in San Diego. They're out on the beaches, sleeping on the beaches, and at the beaches in the day. It's a beautiful downtown area in San Diego. A lot of malls, they're in the malls, they're on the sidewalk, and they have a beautiful park. Have you been to San Diego, the Balboa Park? Oh my God, it's beautiful. Verdant hillsides that go on and on. About 11 museums at the top of the hill. It's beautiful. And homeless people went and slept there. So the people of San Diego saw a rising number. They were concerned. So they thought, we need to, do, what's going on here? So they asked the university there to do a little study. And sure enough, the, the university concluded, yes, the numbers are rising. So the people of San Diego thought, is there something we can do about this? So they commissioned the university to do a study. And what the university did was simple. 
They follow just 15 people, some on the beach, some on the parks, some on the streets. They followed them for, 15, for 18 months. Now, I don't mean they followed them like they were right behind them. Not like now the NSC would have done that. We know that. Uh, they followed them in the sense of they had they could get administrative data from different systems and they knew that the people were hitting this system or that system. Now the general thinking of the population in San Diego was homeless people do compromise our quality of life because they're, they're on the street and the park and the beaches. But like, you know, that's about the only we don't really have any cost concerns about them because how costly is the person lying there on the beach or out in the park? So, so the university followed these 15 people for 18 months. What they discovered was that in those 18 months, those 15 people cost the city and county of San Diego $3 million, or an average of $200,000 a person over those 18 months. How could that be if a person's just lying? Oh, they're not always lying on the street or in the, sometimes they're taken by ambulance to the emergency room of the hospital and have hospitalizations and pharmaceuticals. Do you know the average cost of an emergency room visit in our country? And you know, when you hit an emergency room, by federal law, you have to be administered a series of tests. That's federal law. The, the average cost of an emergency room visit in our country is $1,000 just appearing there. Some of those homeless people were going into that emergency room three times a month, five times a month, five times a week. And they not only had the information from the emergency rooms of hospitals and all of that, they also had the data from the acute side of mental health and substance abuse programs, how many times those homeless people were going into the most expensive way to access mental health and substance abuse services, just as the emergency room, you can't access primary health more expensively than that. And they also found out what the costs were in the courts, because sometimes homeless people end up there, in incarceration. So whether it was judges or jailers or police intervening or firefighters intervening in 9-11 calls, and what they did was they took all those numbers and they added them up, and that's how they got to the $3 million. So that was an average cost of $133,000 per year per homeless person. Now you would have thought that would be the thing that would be most upsetting to the people in San Diego because they were thinking, wait a minute, you mean we could have rented an Oceanside penthouse condominium, <laughs> made concierge attend to every need, and that would have been a less expensive, inter and they did the arithmetic on that, and it was true. But that wasn't what irritated them the most. Here's what irritated them most. That after the expenditure of that $3 million, because you couldn't call it an investment, could you? Because what's the one thing we all anticipate from an investment? Wow, you, you guys are sophisticated economically up here. I once asked that to uh, a, a group in Chicago of about 400 people. There wasn't one person who said return. I had to call the Small Business Administration to go in and do remedial work with them because they didn't know what an investment was. Well, what really bugged the people in San Diego was after they had expended $3 million, those 15 people, they were in the same place as they were at the beginning of the year. Same street corner, same doorway, same park, same beach. So they were just going to spend that money again the next year. That was beyond their comprehension. Well, what's happened across our country is that lots of cities have done this kind of cost study. And then they've looked at the cost of a person once the intervention of housing is made in their life and how much it costs the year after housing. So the year before they were housed, the year after they were housed. Here's what the data shows. 70 cities, here's the range in those cities. The range of the cost of that chronic homeless person that this fund has housed here in Nashua and Harbor Homes has housed for many years. Those people in all of these cities, 
they cost the public purse between thirty-five and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per person per year. In that random ricocheting through health and law enforcement systems. The cost the year after placement, those costs, they ranged from twelve to $25,000 for those same folk once they had been placed in housing. That was the cost of both the housing and the wraparound services to ensure that the tenancy would be stable. So you can spend dollars to $150,000 to maintain people in homelessness, or you could spend twelve dollars to $25,000 to literally end their homelessness. You don't need to be Warren Buffett or even Susie Orman <laughs> to figure out which of those is the better investment. You don't have to have a PhD in economics from MIT to know. So what's happened around our country is that there are those moral and spiritual reasons that I would guess that most all of us in this room, that's the way we come to this issue. But unfortunately, those moral and spiritual and humanitarian arguments never sustained Sometimes they didn't even initiate political will. And without political will, you cannot get the job done. You need government to be a partner in what you do, and then you layer on the private sector resources. Well, what cost studies and cost-benefit analysis, all of those studies all over our country, not only did they initiate political will, because for the first time, mayors and county executives and governors heard this issue in a vernacular that they understood, and not in a way that they had heard it over and over and over again, so they were anesthetized to the idea of the vulnerability of the people. Finally, they heard it in economic terms. Once they heard it in economic terms, they couldn't sign up fast enough to do something different. They didn't want to be fall prey to the Einstein idea of insanity. They wanted to do something different that would get the job done. They wanted to place people in housing, that that was, in fact, the way to get the job done. So that's, in fact, what's happened around our country. That's made the difference in our country. We, we changed the mindset. It evolved from simply servicing homeless people to solving their homelessness. And that evolution captured the imagination of governors, mayors, county executives, people who just lived in the community, business people, civic leaders. That's what's captured their imagination. That's exactly what's happened here in Nashua. Because without the capturing of that kind of civic attention and the private sector resources that come with that, we can't get the job done, even though we know what to do and we know how to do it. Without that kind of involvement, we're not going to get this job done. That's why the fund, the Ending Homelessness Fund, is so important to the work that's being done here in Nashua. That's why your involvement with it, your contribution to it, is so important. I'll tell you one other quick story, and then I'll wrap up. You know, if you don't have the right diagnosis, it's hard to do the right prescription. You heard Peter talking about having the right diagnosis, the right prescription, and then the right medica, whatever it is. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I know there are a bunch of doctors here. I met most of them. And I know there's a cardiologist in case I drop. There's a cardiologist. There's an ophthalmologist, I think, in case I can't see you or my notes. He'll come up and help me. There's even a shrink here, just in case I go off the deep end in the middle of this. So we love doctors, don't we? We do. Well, this is about a doctor. An elderly man went to see a doctor, and the doctor was so concerned. It's a primary health doctor. He was so concerned about the well-being of this elderly man. He, 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 he examined him and studied him and thought he had the right diagnosis for this elderly man. And he, he just gave some instruction to the elderly man. And he was so concerned about this elderly man, he wanted to see him the very next week. Because you know, if a doctor wants to see you the next week, it must be serious, as you know, in an HMO world. So uh, he gave instructions to the elderly gentleman. And uh, it was pretty, he was pretty serious about it. And the elderly gentleman left his office. And wouldn't you know that later that week, the doctor, walking down the street in the town, sees the elderly man across the street, and this elderly man has a new, 
energy in his step. It's amazing. He's, he just seems like a different person. He's walking along. And the doctor notes that he has a beautiful young lady on his arm. And the doctor is just amazed, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to uh, interfere here. So he just goes on. So a week passes, and the elderly gentleman comes back to his office. And the doctor casually mentions that he saw the elderly man out on the street, and also, I saw, you looked great, and I saw you had a beautiful young lady on your arm. And the elderly man said, well, exactly, I was just doing exactly what you told me to do. And the doctor said, really? What, what were you doing? The, the elderly man said, well, you told me to live carefree and to get a hot mama. <laughs> and the doctor said, no, 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 no. I said, live carefully, you have a heart murmur. <laughs> but I guess that's a lesson on why people want to self-medicate, I guess. <laughs> So if you get the diagnosis, if there's confusion about the diagnosis, that prescription is going to be off, isn't it? Isn't it? But if you've got the right diagnosis, that helps you to get the right prescription. For years, we had the wrong diagnosis, so our prescription was all wrong. We left people out instead of bringing them in. We left them languishing instead of taking care of them. We left them as outsiders instead of welcoming them into our community. Well, finally, we've got the right diagnosis, and we know what to do about it. And we've got the right prescription. We know how to do it. So our work together in this community, in Nashua and across our country, is to put to work that diagnosis and that prescription to get the job done. It is wrong in any way that you can conceive wrong, moral, spiritual, ideologically, certainly economically. It is wrong for some of our neighbors not to have a place to live. So our work together is to ensure that we bring remedy to that situation. That's our work together. That's what this fund is about. That's what Harbor Homes has been doing in this community, but it needs your help to scale up the effort. You've seen that movie Selma? Hands, Selma? Selma, it's about the, mar the Great March, led by Dr. King, and you know, his birthday was just a little while ago, and we're, gonna, we're on the precipice of going into Black History Month, and you know that one of the great insights that Dr. King had, he actually borrowed this from an abolitionist, a Bostonian abolitionist at that. The insight is that the long moral arc of history bends toward justice. And it doesn't look like that every day or every week or every month, every year, every decade. It doesn't look like that. But the insight that he had and with other prophetic folk, that that long moral arc of the American experience and I would submit to you the long moral arc of the Nashua experience bends inevitably toward justice. And when we're talking about justice for our neighbors who don't have a place to live, what would justice palpably look like for that person who doesn't have a place to live? A home. So our job through the fund is to reach our arms up to that ark, to make sure that it gets bent into the lives of our poorest neighbors here in Nashua to ensure that they feel and experience what justice can be in their lives so that they have that feeling that Laura had when she heard that she had that job and that her kids would be secure, that John had when he got back into housing, that hundreds in fact, more than a 1,000 people in your community have had that feeling because Harbor Homes has made the investment through its proper diagnosis and proper prescription to place people back into housing who weren't in housing. That's the work. And to the degree that this fund grows, 
more of your neighbors will feel that justice come into their life. I don't know anything more you could do, a better way to invest your time and your energy and your resources than to make that happen for your neighbors. I'm proud of you, Nashua. I want to be prouder when I come back sometime in the future and this fund is bigger and more and more of your neighbors have their homelessness ended. Thank you for your great work continuing. It's great. Wow, I'm fired up. <laughs> Philip, your message was accurate and powerful. Your delivery was inspirational. Clearly, you're an evangelist for this cause, and we're fortunate to have you here tonight. <laughs> well, with all the amens flying around, I feel like we should have been in a big tent um, here tonight. Thank you for coming in and spending this evening with us. We're about to wrap up uh, the formal program here. Before we do, just a couple of things. First, I believe we have a raffle prize to give away. Somewhere in the back of the room is a big old basket of Nashua local-based products and goodies, and someone is the lucky winner of that here tonight. Mary, thank you for helping me with this. So if you have your ticket, I'll read the last four digits. 8291. Excellent, all right, we got a winner. Thanks. <laughs> also, if I could just direct your attention to your program, you should have seen a little envelope in your programs around your seats. If you could just pull that out for a quick second, you can help be a part of this cause tonight. As you leave here, you can put a check into this envelope and put it in a basket that's right over here, uh, right there it is, the little box that's floating around here in the middle of the room. You can write a check, put it in the envelope, and drop that in on your way out. If you don't have a checkbook on you, and you're like me, you do a lot of online contributions, this will tell you how to do that as well. You can go online after tonight and make a contribution to help with the 2015 fund that's kicking off here this evening. I'm told there's already a healthy chunk of pledges that are coming in for this year, and you can be a part of that here tonight or when you get home this evening, going online and making a contribution. So please do that with these envelopes here tonight. I want to thank again our friends at the Not Average Joe's restaurant providing the food. And there's a whole bunch of other baked goodies back there that volunteers helped cook. So give them a big round of applause. I'm also eyeing a lot of food still there. So I think we're all uh, strongly encouraged to eat some more food on the way out, take it with you, um, and, and have a good dinner here on your way home this evening. Also, I hope you had time to browse some paintings that are in the back of the room. They, those were donated for sale tonight by local artist Richard Weedu. He is donating the proceeds of any sales for his art pieces to the Homeless Fund. So you can not only take home a nice piece of local art, but also be a part of the fund by looking at those art pieces that are in the back of the room. Thank you again. Peter, you have a terrific team here. Mary Tamposi was great in helping me prepare for this event. Thank you for coming out on such a cold night and staying with us here this evening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, not only listening to Philip, but to John and Laura and to Peter here this evening. Thank you again to the governor for being with us here tonight, and thanks again to our representatives from our congressional delegation. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye.